So welcome everyone um, to today's gardening series class. My name is Stephen Glenn. I'm the management analyst for Ventura Water. Today we have Laura Allen with Graywater Action um, doing a presentation on um, graywater and rainwater capture. So we're really excited to have her here. With that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Laura. Thanks, Stephen. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your Saturday or whenever you're watching this, since it is recorded, to learn about gray water and rainwater. I'm titling this drought resilient homes and landscape because gray water and rainwater are two kind of tools in the toolbox of ways that we can make our homes and our landscape resilient to drought, productive, beautiful, um, that work with our natural environment, with the natural amount of rainfall we get and even during drought conditions. So I'm with Gray Water Action. We're um, a nonprofit organization and we educate about these technologies of rainwater, gray water, and also waterless toilets. Um, I do a lot of work with education, work with cities and uh, nonprofits and homeowners um, and renters. And I also work on policy change. So trying to make codes and policies in alignment with sustainability. So I'm happy to be here with you. And we're going to get started. There'll be times for questions. So I'll do some pauses in the presentation, just so you know. But please, whenever something comes up, throw it in the chat. And we'll make sure that if I'm not going to address it already, that we can uh, talk about it. And if any, anyone can let me know if the screen share is not working, I just transition to the next slide. So we should. OK, great. So for most of us, when we turn on the tap, water flows out. It's almost like magic. Many people don't even think about it or question that clean water is going to come flowing out of our taps. And we often forget that if it wasn't in our homes, it would have been somewhere else. It might have been in a river, uh, might have been in a lake, it might have been in the groundwater that would have emerged into a spring and sustained other water sources. And so we're taking water directly from nature, no matter where we live or where our water comes from. And if we weren't using it, it would have provided this life-sustaining material that we can't live without for some other living creature. And many people don't even know where their water comes from. So just take a minute and think, where does your water come from? You might know the answer to this because this is being hosted by your water agency. But if you don't, um, think for a minute and I encourage you wherever you are to learn more about your water source and really understand you know, what impacts we're having with our, with our homes as we're drawing out of natural water systems. And we, in the United States, we have access to a lot of water, even in really dry places. And I just want to share this just briefly, kind of stepping back in the global picture of oh. the world. We, we use more water than any other uh, nation, at, you know, period. That doesn't mean every single person in the U.S. uses more water. Or if, it doesn't mean every single person actually has access to clean drinking water. But on average, we use the most, about 150 gallons per person per day for residential use. And this chart shows the range of all these different countries, starting on the left, that's the lowest, the water, you know, scarce nations where people have very little water, which is not, you know, healthy. And then in the middle, we have a lot of European countries, you can see the United Kingdom has uses 40 gallons per person per day on average, France 76. And I just want you to think for a minute, you know, why are we so much higher, similar standard of living, you're at Western Europe to the United States, but very different water uses. And so just think for a minute, and if we were in a live presentation, you could share your answers. But since we're on Zoom, I'm just going to tell you that our landscapes really are the biggest reason we use so much more water, because we have brought this notion of a landscape um, kind of coming from early colonization when Europeans came to the eastern U.S. and brought their idea of landscape traveled west. So now we're many of European uh, people of European ancestry and just our culture in general looking at our plants. These come from other places where it's a lot wetter. And so to sustain these landscapes, we have to irrigate them. And that uses a lot of water. And we're probably not gonna be able to, well, we definitely are not gonna be able to operate as we have been going forward. Water risks are all over the country. Um, this map is showing you by 2050, which parts of the country are suspected or anticipated to have water risk. And you can see it's not just California, it's a lot of the West and it's not even just the West. There's a lot of places. And in California, as you're very aware, drought is um, this kind of ever pressing issue with our water supplies. And right now there's an extreme drought. Um, this isn't going away, though this drought might end soon, hopefully, or not, um, depending on na uh, nature and climate change and all of that. It's going to come back. So living with drought conditions is just something that we need to do. And it's a great opportunity for us to shift how we've been using water, how we've been using what we call wastewater and do it a lot better. So it's a great time for learning about all these options that you have. And so when we're in a drought, we often are uh, messed off. A lot of the messaging is, you know, let your lawn die, don't water your plants, 
which is totally important and we have to do it. The previous drought brown is the new green was kind of the mantra. Um, and that's really important. It's definitely necessary, but it doesn't have to be that way because if we tap into other water supplies that are not our municipal supply, we can have these lovely productive landscapes that don't rely on potable water. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna talk about stormwater and rainwater and gray water. And I'll tell you what those are if you're not familiar. Um, we'll talk about kind of strategies to make these all work together and a little bit of planning. So if you're going forward and thinking about which ones you might wanna implement, just give you a little bit of um, resources and ideas for how to move forward with this information. And before I start, I just want to encourage you, if you haven't already done this, to look at your fixtures and appliances in your home with just a switching out of a shower head, of a toilet, of a washing machine. You know, washing machine is a little <clears throat> harder to switch out than a shower head, but basically you're just swapping one thing for another. You can have exactly the same experience, having your clothes get clean, having a nice shower, using a lot less water. And so if you, a home that's water efficient, that has like water sense, um, which is a standard for a fit for fixtures and appliances. If you compare a water sense home, a water efficient home to a typical home, you can save 35% of the water. Uh, so that's a lot. So if you haven't done that, I encourage you to start there. Start with conservation and then we'll get into the reuse that I'm going to talk about. So at this home level, like a single family home, just a you know, one person home or a one family home, or maybe a duplex, that's the size of thing that I'm going to be talking about mostly, there's several sources of alternate water. Uh, rainwater falls from the sky, that can be used, and I'm going to talk about how. Stormwater, that's the water that lands on the ground or runs off the roof onto the ground, that's also a resource, and we'll talk about that today. Then there's gray water, water that you already used in the home from your showers and your um, baths and your washing machines, um, sinks, and that can be reused. Uh, homes also produce black water, that's combined water once the toilet has mixed into that, and that's definitely a resource, though typically at the home scale, um, and especially if you're on a sewer system, that's not really going to be an option, so that's why it's much easier to, re to keep gray water out of the system, but if you're on a septic system, which I'm not sure if any of you are, but sometimes in septic systems, um, homes can reuse all of the water with um, a treatment system, though California it's not quite um, encouraged yet. So it's something to consider and learn about. And then if you have an air conditioning unit, there is something called mechanical water um, or air conditioning condensate water. And usually homes don't produce a lot of that, but larger buildings do. Just to be aware that there is this other source of water that's coming from any time there's um, an air conditioning unit, it's creating this mechanical water that's typically just wasted, but could be redirected for reuse. And so those are all the options. And I'm going to talk about the rainwater and gray water today. And so we'll start with rainwater because that's, it's not exactly an alternate supply though we'll talk about it like it is because our, the way we've set up our cities is typically to completely ignore rainwater as a source of water, even though it's falling from the sky and landing on our houses and literally just running off our landscapes. We typically just try to get it away as quick as possible. And that's caused a lot of problems. Um, that kind of mentality and the way we've set up our cities that now we're having to go back and fix. Um, and one of the biggest problems with what we've done is it creates what's called stormwater pollution. So when you imagine a city, it's full of um, dog poop, it's full of trash, it's full of people who put herbicides and pesticides on their landscapes, it's full of brake dust, it's full of little oil slicks from cars that leak oil on the street or in their driveways. And then when it rains, the rain gets takes all of that and flushes it into the nearest waterway through the storm drain system. It is a huge source of pollution. It's really harmful to all the things that live in the creeks, rivers, bay, ocean, because it just moves all of our urban pollution and puts it out into the water, where it's directly touching all these living things. So that's what's called stormwater pollution. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is really a strategy to stop stormwater pollution, but it's also really beneficial for your own landscape, because if you keep rainwater on your own site, you're giving deep irrigation to your plants, and you're keeping it on site, which means it's not turning into stormwater pollution, which happens if it gets off your property. And so simple things you can do is making your landscapes more permeable. That means they soak up water instead of flushing it away. So using, having, yeah. that, um, and somebody's not on mute. So if you just check your uh, microphones and make sure you're on mute. 
if you um, use permeable pathing material, then when the rain lands on it, it will soak down using paving stones with in between. It could be gravel or wood chips or other material that lets water soak in. You can still have nice pathways and the wine water can soak in. Also just having plants, deep rooted plants will help infiltrate uh, water on your site. A rain garden, this is now a landscape feature that you would create, especially to soak up rainwater. That is another really great way to keep stormwater, keep rainwater on your site and have this really lovely landscape feature. So how it works is you have you know, your home, right? so rain is falling on the home, it's going through your gutter system, and you now direct where the water leaves the gutter system through your downspout into an area that you have created. It's like a basin, kind of a shallow bowl that you've planted with native plants. The ones in the middle are gonna get wet. So they're ones that can handle being wet and then getting to the edges. These are native plants that are typically dry. And <clears throat> these plants are gonna be soaking up that water the bowl that you've created can really soak up a lot of water at a time. You'll actually have standing water after a rain event, and then it will slowly soak down. And so this is a really um, very effective strategy to soaking up a lot of water on your site. And you create this beautiful garden feature that doesn't need uh, extra irrigation. So here's some pictures. These are used all over the country in very wet climates, <clears throat> very dry climates, um, because even if you get one inch of rain, that one inch of rain can do a lot of damage to the nearby water systems, uh, can also cause you know, flash flooding and other things that are harmful. So even in dry climates, rain gardens are really important because they can soak up the small amounts of rain that come. Um, and a small amount of rain kind of in the like average rainfall numbers is actually a, a lot of water. <clears throat> so you can see the picture on the right, that's in the Pacific Northwest, that's in Washington, the picture on the lower, excuse me, the picture on the left, that's the Washington, the lower picture on the right, that is in Southern California. So the plants are going to be different, but the concept is the same. These are also used to catch runoff from roads and parking lots. So you'll probably seen them now. They're required to be done when anytime there's new construction to prevent this pollution. So you're, you've probably seen them in new-ish developments of, you know, printing anything that's being developed, you're going to see the stormwater managed. So if you just kind of start looking around, you might see these in your city. Um, and just to kind of overall, <clears throat> you're using rain gardens to irrigate natives and to prevent stormwater pollution. So this is a strategy for capturing rainwater, but it's happening in the ground. So the water is staying on your site, but it's not a way where you can then use that water later on. That's a different kind of rainwater system. So, um, and maybe I'll pause for a second. Did anyone have any questions about rain gardens or managing stormwater, what you could do on your site or anything I mentioned so far? Because I'm gonna switch to catching it in like storage tanks next. Hi, Laura, it's Steven. Um, so uh, Jeanette did have a question about um, the backwash that comes from your water softener. Mm -hmm. um, can that be used? Is, and is that considered mechanical water? Backwash is a little different because it contains, mechanical water is like distilled water. It's very clean. Backwash is not as clean. So that um, I'm, I'm not sure it would kind of depend on a few things, um, but it would be worth looking into and we could talk offline or maybe afterwards she could tell me a bit more about what, it, what it's coming from. Okay, great. Yeah, we do have here in the city of Ventura, we have very hard water. So I would say about 95% of residents have a water softener. Okay. Yeah, if it's like a home water softener, then the back flush wash is not going to be suitable. Okay. It's going to be very salty. So far, that is the only question that we've had. So just a reminder, um, if you do have questions, so just go ahead and put them in the chat and then we will uh, we'll ask Laura about them when we have these pauses. Now I'm going to talk about capturing the rain, actually storing it in a container. And the previous way I talked about was slowing and sinking the water into the ground. These strategies can all happen on the same site. So this picture of a home is using kind of three different ways to manage rainwater. There's a, a rain garden in the front of that picture to just sink the water into the ground. Uh, on the far left of a picture, there's a small catchment system that's just catching the surges of rainwater and then so soaking it into a rain garden. And then there's a storage system on the far upper um, right side of the picture, storing it in a container. <clears throat> and that's where you want to store it and then you can use that water later on. And rainwater catchment, um, you get a lot of water. If your home is a thousand square foot, the roof, which is a 
kind of rather small sized home. Though of course it depends on the neighborhood and a lot of factors, but it's on the small side for American homes. Every time it rains one inch, you can collect 600 gallons of water. So it's definitely significant. And if you think about you're collecting 600 gallons and your neighbor is and all of your neighbors, that really can add up to a lot of water. So even in places like Ventura where the average rainfall is 17 though, Stephen told me last year it was three plus inches, um, you know, even that can be thousands of gallons of water. And then if you do get your average rainfall, that's really a lot of, a lot of water. And typically you can't actually store that, all that water on your site, but you can definitely collect some of that and put some of that to good use and then soak the rest of it into the ground. And so a rain barrel, this is a really kind of common, super easy thing that you can do. 50 gallons about, you put your downspout into the rain barrel. You have to manage the overflow, of course, because that's going to fill up in a couple of moments of a hard rainstorm or a couple of minutes in a regular rainstorm. Um, it fills up pretty quick. And then you can use it later on. You can connect rain barrels together in a line. So have them, even though you're just managing these smaller barrels that can fit in the back of your car, a couple can fit in a pickup truck, um, you can connect them up together and get hundreds of gallons of storage. So that's something that's popular to start with. Uh, there's a picture of what it can look like. This is at a school. You need to get the water into them and there's different ways. You can redirect the gutter directly into them. Um, this other picture kind of in the middle, this is a popular way because you just cut a little hole in your downspout and you attach this piece that flows water into it. And then when the rain barrel's full, no more water comes in. The rest of it just continues to go through your gutter, your downspout system. And so that's kind of an easier installation because you don't have to then have an overflow and then redirect the overflow. So that's a really popular thing that to do. It costs about $30, $40 and it's very easy to install. So then you can use the, the water. You can just have a garden hose connected to it. You can have a watering can or you can have a larger uh, drip irrigation system. Um, those are typically used for bigger storage because since uh, 50 gallons is not really that much water compared to how much your landscape wants to soak up, it's, it's not really um, very um, beneficial to set up a whole irrigation system for that little amount of water. But if you have a bigger tank, then you can actually set up a whole irrigation system. And so just to put the, the numbers in context, if you have 100 square feet of planted area in the summer, how much irrigation it needs, if it's a lawn, it needs about 90 gallons per week. So that's, you know, almost twice as much as one rain barrel. If it's a vegetable garden, it needs about 70 gallons. And if it's a low water use, like California natives, low water use natives, that's about 15 gallons. So you can see how your rainwater, if you're going to use that for irrigation, you definitely want to be having your low water use plants planted that are also beautiful, attract pollinators, um, just a really nice addition to the landscape. Uh, that's much more suitable than a lawn, for example. And that also might make you want to think, catch more rainwater. So you can have a tank. Um, rain tanks are kind of similar to a rain barrel. They're just a lot bigger. They can be thousands of gallons. Um, they're it, probably not in Ventura, but other places you'll find, you know, 10,000 gallon tanks, people who are really utilizing the water. So of course, there's a lot of factors of uh, how much you have available, rainfall, um, why you're doing it, all of that. But thousand gallon tanks are easy to fill even in a drier climate. So you have your catchment surface, you have to have a roof, you have to have gutters and downspouts. And then with this, you're gonna be screening the openings to prevent mosquitoes from getting in. Also to keep out leaves, there's kind of different levels of screening. So first you have a leaf screen that gets keeps the leaves out of your tank. Um, then you might have what's called a first flush diverter. It's a pipe that's next to that rain tank that keeps the dirtiest water out of the system. Then the water goes into your tank. Rainwater is very clean when it falls from the sky. It just might pick up dirt and debris on your roof. So that's why you're having this filtration and kind of diversion of the dirtier water. So in the tank, it's storing very clean water. You can store it as long as you want. You always want an overflow because it will fill up and then the extra water needs somewhere to go. And then you have a way to get out the water. It could just be a garden hose or you could set up like a, a low pressure, zero pressure drip irrigation system. You also could set up a pumped and filtered system. Um, for a more complex rainwater catchment system. So here's some pictures. Um, this is kind of a two, same, same system, but two images. You can see on the left, it's coming out of the, the gutter system, going through that first flush diverter that keeps the first flush of the rain uh, out of your tank, which is the dirtiest. Then it goes into the tank. The tank is screened, prevent mosquitoes, and it just goes to a garden hose. That's a 500 gallon tank. So it's a, you know, relatively small for a rainwater tank. 
Um, rain tanks can be plastic, they can be metal, um, they can be different shapes. The standard kind of the most, the lowest cost is like the green circular tank. That's the most common. It can be painted. Um, it can have, you can plant vines around it to kind of cover it. You can make it blend into your landscape um, or it could be a giant chalkboard. We learned in, in my house, we put in a 3000 gallon tank and discovered that that material is a great uh, chalkboard. It like chalk goes on it. So all the kids like to draw on it and make pictures. And we just, we were thinking, oh, we're gonna you know plant vines or paint or something, make it beautiful. But we just decided let's leave it. It's a huge chalkboard to play with. It gets washed off when it rains. So with the rain tank, you also have to get the water from your gutter system into the tank. Um, you can directly go kind of straight into the tank like the bottom image is showing. You also don't have to do that. You can have what's called a wet system where you're piping down, you're going underground and then you can travel a fair distance and then you can come back up into the tank. This works if the tank opening is lower than where you're getting the water from that gutter. So you do have to be lower down and then by gravity, the water's gonna flow into your tank. So that can be nice. You can set the tank away from the house. Um, it can be more just have more options for location. And then keeping it clean, I talked about that a bit ago. This picture is showing kind of a common uh, screen to keep out the leaves. It's called a leaf eater. Uh, keep the water flows into it. The water goes down, the leaves get stuck there and kind of get brushed to the side. And you do need to clean that off on occasion. Screens, of course, are really important. There's different types of screening, but you always want to think about when you have stored water, you mosquitoes, if they can enter the water and get in there, they will and they'll breed and you definitely don't want that. So make sure that your system is designed to prevent any mosquito breeding activity. And then these systems can be used, um, there can be more complex systems. These are sometimes done in homes. Um, they're sometimes done in commercial buildings. This picture is showing one that's actually in a commercial building. It's collecting the rainwater and it's then it's using it back indoors for toilet flushing. The rainwater is filtered and disinfected in the system because it's a, a more public setup. Um, at the residential level, it kind of depends on your local authority, what they would like to see, but sometimes rainwater can just be simply screened and then used for toilet flushing. Sometimes it's also disinfected in case there's contamination on the roof and then it goes to flush the toilet. It can be cleaned to potable standards, though in California that's not allowed currently. Now other places like in um, Washington state allows that, Texas, Hawaii, there's a lot of rain systems that are used for potable water. So they just go through more you know, drinking water filters that get the water to drinking water quality. And then the home uses that for their entire supply. Um, so when you think about rainwater, you want to think about the first question is, what are you going to use the water for? If you're just wanting to irrigate native plants, a rain garden is going to suit you the best. If you want to help the environment, a rain garden is the best choice. If you want to irrigate like a vegetable garden, then you need to store the water. So rain barrels or a tank is going to help you do that. Um, then think about where can you locate the system? How will you get the water there? And then thinking about all the screens and you know managing the overflow, that kind of detail. Um, I'll, at the end, I'll give you some resources that will give more information. So if you're wanting to do a rainwater system, this is a great intro, but it's not going to give you enough to actually go and do it. Um, so I'll, I'll end with some, some resources so you can get more information. And I'm going to pause there to see if there's any rainwater questions. Yes, we did have a couple of questions. Um, so Jeanette says that um, her rain system, rain barrels actually collect water from condensation um, from, I guess, morning fog. And then oh. she's asking if there are um, any units that collect condensation, you know, just from the air, if you know like about fog? it. Yeah, there, there's definitely fog collection systems. I'm not very familiar with them. They're, I think, mostly being employed like internationally for places that don't have drinking water, because that, that's going to be a potable, it's very, you know, very clean water. It has to be done in the right climate where there is a lot of moisture and morning moisture typically. Um, so I, I have never seen one of those systems here, though I know that there's a lot of research going into them. And my understanding is it's mostly for international drinking water situations, though I could just not be aware of it. Um, so sorry. Okay. Yeah. And if you are in, I did recently see something in the news about a residential system um, that's able to pull moisture out of the air, but I know in like Lima, Peru, where they don't have access to a, a potable source, um, they actually have like a big billboard um, and it collects 
collects water from the atmosphere. So yeah, that's so cool. That's how I've heard about it too. That. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, second question, are there any concerns of using the rainwater collected from uh, asphalt shingle roof? Um, for like irrigating food crops? Um, yeah. Specifically, sorry, for edible gardens. For edible gardens, yeah. So typically um, the asphalt shingle roof is considered suitable for any kind of rain system, for outdoor rain system, including vegetables. You might want to have like a, if you have an asphalt shingle roof, have a good first flush diverter system. So the dirtiest water that's going to flush any like little stuff that's moving through the roof or debris on the roof, that will stay out of your system. Um, but there's, yeah, you can use that asphalt shingle is suitable. If you're not comfortable with it, then you could choose to irrigate non, non-edible non plants too. Okay, great. And a follow-up question to that from Susan is what type of roofing material is most optimal for collecting rainwater? Yeah, so most optimal, um, pretty much any roofing material is suitable uh, except for there's some wood roofs that they put a fungicide like to prevent moss from growing into the wood. And so that would not be suitable. Other than that, any roof is. Um, the best quality water comes off of metal roofs uh, because it just doesn't have as much debris. It's more of a, a cleaner surface. So people who plan are planning like a home and they know they're going to want to do like rainwater for indoor use, they might they would probably choose a metal roof. Um, but you can, any kind of roof is fine. The, the living roofs, those will have a lot more kind of discoloration of water coming out of it because it's going through a soil. Like you, you've probably seen living roofs. So some, sometimes there's like other considerations, but if it's just a house and the roof, any material is going to be fine. Um, though, again, if you're going to do indoor, you probably would want a metal roof. Okay, great. And that's it as far as questions. I do want to give a, a kind of a plug to a city program. So if you are interested in rain barrels, Ventura Water does offer a, uh, a coupon where you can receive a rain barrel for 50% off. So I'll include a link to that program in the chat. Great. So now we're going to move to part two, which is gray water. So this is water that you've now already got into your home. You've already used it and usually it just gets flushed away to the sewer treatment plant. Um, and so for many people, water goes down the drain. That's the end of the story. It's gone. It went away. Don't really think about it. But of course, you know that there is no away. The water went somewhere. And in Ventura, it goes to your wastewater treatment plant where it's cleaned. The nutrients are removed from it. Um, it's disinfected. And then it, some of it's reused. Um, Stephen can probably tell more than that um, So I don't live in Ventura. And then most of it's discharged into the, and eventually gets out into the ocean. Uh, and so gray water is an intervention to take the cleanest part of your waste stream and reuse that on your site. So you don't have to send it through this whole system that's designed to clean and, and dispose of the water. Gray water systems can be really simple. They just take the water that you've used and send it out to your plants. And it turns out uh, we use a lot of water, like I mentioned at the beginning, in our landscaping. On average, it's half, half the water we use inside the home and half we use outside. And our plants don't need the same quality of water as we do. They do not need potable drinking water. They have some different considerations than other, like us and discharging into the ocean, but they definitely don't need this clean drinking water. And so gray water is a very suitable source for them so long as we manage what we put in the water. And I'm gonna talk about that, like what products you use that will make the water safe for plants. There's a lot of benefits. It, gray water, it saves water, which is gonna protect watersheds because it's gonna reduce the amount we're drawing out of the environment. So if water is coming into our home, it's going away, and then we're then irrigating with gray water, we can bring the water to our home, use a lot of it for irrigation, so we don't need to be irrigating with our potable drinking water. Um, it also saves time. It's an automatic irrigation system. It saves energy. So when you don't send water to the treatment plant, you don't need to have that in energy intensive process that is important to clean the water so it can be safely discharged. You're just bypassing that step because you're using the natural cleaning system of the soil on your site. It also connects us to our landscapes, which is really important. It teaches us how to be better uh, stewards of water, how to understand what we put into the water, how it affects the, the environment. It might encourage product choices depending on what products you use. Um, and it connects us you know, into this direct relationship between us do what we're doing in our homes and now growing a healthy landscape. If you're on a septic system, it can extend the life of a septic because it's reducing the overall flows going out to the septic. And then there's some questions about fire protection. There's been a few examples of 
gray water hydrated landscapes, having that area when a fire has come through not burn because the landscape was very hydrated. So of course this is not, there hasn't been studies on this. I'm not saying it's gonna fireproof um, anything, but there has been some anecdotal evidence that these really moistened um, gray water irrigated plants are fire resistant. So that's um, definitely encouraging to think about. And there's more too. So with, with reusing gray water, you can typically see between 16 and 40% reduction in total water use. And that's a really wide range. And that's because when your home is built, you might not be able to actually access all your gray water sources. This picture is showing a home where you can tap into the showers and the sinks. They're going to irrigate a section of the landscape. You can tap into the washing machine. That's irrigating a different part of the landscape. Um, the sink over there is irrigating somewhere else. And so in this home, all the different gray water fixtures are working together to irrigate a pretty large portion, almost the entire uh, portion of this landscape. If you go to your house, you might find, wow, I have a slab on grade foundation. My shower pipes are buried in cement. I can't access them. My only option is my washing machine. So that's going to give you some savings for sure, but it's not going to be as much as if you could tap into all of your gray water sources. Or you might just find that you're yeah, there's just different site constraints. So when you go to a home that's already built, the yard's already there, you might not be able to tap into all of it. And to get water savings, design is really important. Um, on its own, a great water system will not necessarily save you any water. You have to be replacing irrigation that you had been doing with gray water. And now you stop irrigating with the other source and now you get savings. So this image, the chart on the left is showing you a study that we did of uh, real gray water systems in California, this was a couple of years ago, and looked at the water um, bills from the homes, water data from the water agency before they put in the gray water system and after. And you can see the red line is pre-gray water, the black line is post-gray water, so you can see they had a savings. It was on average about 15,000 gallons per year, and that's what you should see if you are replacing irrigation. The picture on the right is a great example of what not to do. Um, this home put in new planting, so they had they had a lawn it's green. This is in Southern California, so this lawn is irrigated. Then they put in new plantings, new fruit trees, right in the middle of their lawn. They watered those with the laundry system, and the lawn is still green, so they are still watering the lawn. So what they did was now they're double irrigating their trees, and they're not saving any water. So just from looking at that picture, you could tell there's no way for this particular gray water system to save water. If this was your home and you wanted to save water, you could just make a small change. You could take your new plantings, maybe you like fruit trees and you wanna grow some, put them in a section of your yard. Now you don't have the lawn underneath the fruit trees, you have uh, maybe wood chips or maybe you have some other surface that doesn't need irrigation and you shut off the sprinklers that were going to that part of the yard. So now you've cut back your land irrigated landscape and you are having a section irrigated with gray water. So that's a proper design. That's how you're gonna save water. Um, so super basics, gray water, what is it? It's water that came from your washing machines. Washing machines are the first place to look for gray water systems. They're the easiest source to tap into. There's systems that I'll talk about in a couple minutes that don't even need a permit. You just have to follow basic guidelines. They're typically the most affordable, the easiest to install, and they work really great. And they're often a, a large source of gray water from the home. Um, if you have a top loading machine, those machines put out about 30 to 50 gallons per load. If you have a front loading machine, that's about 12 to 25, depends on you know, the age of the machine and how full you fill it. And then a top efficient, those are about 15 to 25. So you can look at those numbers, maybe pick, pick something that, may, let's say you have a front loader, you could pick 15 gallons, and then think about how many loads do you do a week, and then you multiply. So that's gonna give you how much water you have for, from gray water that you could be using to irrigate your plants. Showers and baths are another great source of gray water. The quantity of water is also very high compared to like the bathroom sink, which is one of the other choices. Um, so it's a lot of gray water. Typically, the amount depends on your shower head and how long you shower. But on average, people use about, well, I shouldn't, the average number is, I believe, 15 or 12 or 15 gallons per person per day. But that really varies greatly. So you would do a little bit of calculations to figure out how much you have in your home. Um, it's often harder to get into this, to get into this water, like the slab on grade home. You can't really access it. Um, but if you have a crawl space or a basement, then you typically can. 
Um, it does need a permit because you're gonna be changing your plumbing, but there can be really simple systems that can use this water as well as more sophisticated systems that can divert this water and use it in the landscape. And then the last source is sinks, uh, bathroom sinks. Currently kitchen sinks in California is not put in with the, ca the category of gray water. Other uh, some states it is, some states it isn't. It's kind of a, a very odd thing, but uh, bathroom sinks are considered gray water. But toilet water is not gray water. And so gray water is definitely legal. It's regulated in the state plumbing code. Um, there are like some permits, excuse me, some systems that don't need a permit if you're not actually changing the plumbing of the home, like from the washing machine system, others do, but it's definitely, there's a pathway for getting a permit, reusing gray water. Um, that said, sometimes local jurisdictions, like if you go talk to your plan check department because you want a gray water permit or you know, your inspector, whoever it is, sometimes people don't maybe know about the regulations so well, or they don't like it because it's new and it's not how they were trained when they were younger. Um, different reasons you might be told no, even though it actually is true. Um, or, you know, sometimes tradespeople like plumbers or other contractors, they might not want to do something that's new to them. And so I've unfortunately heard lots of stories of people asking their plumber or their contractor they tell them they want a gray water system and then they're told, oh no, you can't, the permitting is so hard. Well, you know, you can't do it. It's just too much trouble or it's not even allowed or other things that are actually not true. So know that it's legal. Also know that you might, if you're trying to get a permit, have people tell you otherwise, but um, just don't take no for an answer because you definitely can get a permit. And then there are other places that encourage it and support it and will help you. Um, and you might get, you know, lots of, lots of support to get a permit. So hopefully that'll happen to you if you're seeking a permit. And if it doesn't, then you can reach out to uh, people who do, who might be able to help like Ventura Water, who's encouraging um, the proper use of gray water. So how can you use it? First way is for irrigation, outdoor irrigation. That's what I'm mostly going to talk about, but I also want to mention that gray water can be used to flush toilets. Doesn't make a lot of sense that we flush our toilets with clean drinking water, um, but to get gray water, which is dirty, it's got hair, lint, debris um, in it, to get that to be a good enough quality to go into your toilet tank, sit around there overnight, and then flush out and aerosol, to get it clean enough to do that, it requires a very extensive filtration and disinfection system. And that leads to a lot of maintenance. Uh, it's also much harder to get permits because you have pressurized non-potable water coming into the home, you know, nearby to your potable pipe. So there's a lot more concern with that from the regulatory side. Um, but it technically is possible. It's just at the single family home, the kind of residential level, it's not very practical because the systems that will actually do it well cost are very, very expensive. Um, so you'll typically see toilet flushing systems done at like the commercial scale where there's a big building a lot of gray water, not a lot of irrigation need at all because it's a you know big um, building on a smaller lot, and the system can be can take a lot of maintenance because there's a person on site that only does maintenance at the building, and it can clean that water to flush toilets. Uh, but another option, if you're really interested or just really don't like the idea of flushing with potable water, there are these little uh, lids that go that replace the lid, the tank lid of your toilet. And you connect your fill, the hose that's filling up your tank, you just connect it to this lid. And when you flush the toilet, the clean water that's filling your toilet tank goes through that faucet and then you can wash your hands. So it's kind of a little simple, um, it kind of skirts around. It's not really a, it, it's kind of questionable if this actually is a gray water system. It's really just filling up your toilet tank in a different way that you happen to be able to wash your hands in. So that's kind of a, just a cool little device you can get. So now the rest of the time, I'm gonna be talking about outside irrigation. And so with that, what we put in the water is now going out to our plants. So we wanna use what we call plant-friendly products. So these are products that don't contain a lot of salt. Salt over time will build up in the soil and harm plants. They don't contain a lot of boron, the same thing. Boron, if it builds up in the soil, it can harm plants. And chlorine bleach, that kills soil microorganisms. So we don't wanna do that. There are examples of different products. They're gonna be liquid laundry detergents or soap alternatives. Um, in the shower, typically any shampoo or conditioner is fine. It's just cleaning products in the shower might not be good. Like bleach, you can always switch to hydrogen peroxide bleach or for cleaners, you can use like a vinegar based cleaner. Those work well and um, are totally fine for the landscape. 
And then the other thing is about water softeners. So if you have a sodium based water softener, your water is going to have more salt in it. And that's not a good quality for your plants. So that definitely can be a problem in areas with hard water. Um, there are like potassium based water softeners that are suitable. There's salt free water softeners. Um, there's, yeah, I've seen or heard of lots of different kinds of alternatives to salt based. But if your home currently has a salt based water softener, it's not going to be suitable for gray water. Um, sometimes people can bypass their laundry system off the system, off their softener, depending on how hard the water is. If it's possible to, to uh, you not use that on your laundry system, then the laundry water could be suitable, but that's really going to depend on your, the specifics of your, your site. Um, and since a lot of people are on softeners, should I pause here? Is this going to bring up questions? Yeah, we can't, we have a couple of questions. I think you just answered one. Okay. Um, Bonnie said she's currently diverting, um, her washing machine water, um, that contains both laundry soap and bleach and is she doing her her uh, yard harm um it's one of those things where it, it, it just with like products like detergents and bleach like doing it one time if you're irrigating or even a couple of times your bigger land plants like your trees you're not going to see harm it's over time i mean the, the buildup can happen over time in the soil and if your soil becomes saltier it, or extra boron, which is another common thing in cleaners, um, it, the plant cannot uptake nutrients and moisture as it should, and it can cause stress and potentially death to the plant. So I would say don't do it, especially in dry climates. If you're in a really wet, rainy climate, it's going to flush all the salts from the soil. But if you're in a drier climate and you're continuously adding salt to your soil, that's definitely not a good situation for the long run of your plants. So you want to change, make sure you change your products. So you're using detergents that aren't very salty and don't have boron. Don't use chlorine bleach. You could use hydrogen peroxide, or you can just turn off the system. I'll show you some, how these systems work. And there's an easy way to turn them off. So just don't send out bleach water, turn it off. If you're you know, doing whites or whenever you use bleach. Um, so does that, hopefully that answers the question. Okay, great. And then um, Deborah is asking if we have a list of professionals that can help set up a system. And I know that on your website, you do have a list. So I'll include a link to the Gray Water Action site. And then folks who are interested can um, go ahead and take, uh, take a look at installers there. Let's see. And then Jeanette is asking if potassium and soft water system is plant friendly. It is considered plant friendly. And that is it. Oh. So some other considerations with gray water systems is gray water is not potable. And so that means when you set up your system, you don't want people to contact it. So it shouldn't be accessible. It's going under the ground, soaking into the roots where people are not. It's not in tanks or puddles or above ground ponds or places where you know people could play in and get it into their mouth. That's really what you don't want is someone to ingest a non-potable water. Um, it's also, gray water also has nutrients in it. Putting nutrients into your garden, that is good. That's called fertilizer. That's helpful. But if that water has nutrients in it were to get off your property into the storm drain system, into a creek, nutrients are a source of pollution when they get into water because they cause algae to grow. The algae takes oxygen out of the water. The algae dies. It takes more oxygen to break down that. Um, so you don't want nutrients to get into the water. That's why gray water should stay on your property, soak into the ground. It should never be discharged into a you know, hardscape where it could flow into a storm drain. Or there's also what's called setbacks from creeks. If you're near a flowing creek, you don't want to be too close because your gray water could potentially damage or harm the creek. Um, so keep it on the ground, in the ground. The last thing is, since gray water is non-potable, you don't want to ingest it or have other people ingest it. So you can water food plant, that's fine, but you can't water plants where the food is in the ground because that's where the gray water is going. So you don't want the gray water to touch the food plant, get whatever germs are in the gray water onto the food plant. Then if someone came along and ate it, they would get those germs in their body. So don't, don't do that. It's totally fine to irrigate a tree, a fruit tree or bushes, raspberries, even tomato plants where the food is above the ground. The gray water is going into the roots. Any germs, they're going to just be in the soil. They die, you know, because they're not um, in a human body. Um, 
they don't like go into your plant. So not, it's fine to have non-potable water in the soil. And then the food is above the ground. There's no direct touching of that. So those are some health and safety considerations. Um, so now we're going to get into the systems. And I want to mention gray water contains lint, debris, gunk, grease. Um, it's definitely not clean water, which your plants don't care about. Um, they only care about the salt, the boron issues. They don't care about the debris, hair, lint. Um, but if you're putting that gunky water onto soil, it's going to clog the soil and the water won't sink down and you'll get puddle or ponding gray water, which is unsightly, it's smelly, it could breed mosquitoes. It's, you know, you definitely don't want that. And it's not allowed by code. So what we do with the gray water system, we use wood chips, mulch, to be a filter. It's a filter in the landscape. It's a filter that you don't have to clean very often. You actually never clean it. You do replace it once a year. Um, but it's a very effective filter. It catches all the debris and lint and grease, whatever stuff is in the water, sticks on the wood chips, it decomposes outside, and then the water soaks through and irrigates the, the roots of the plant. Very effective, very simple. It works, you know, super good and it's really cheap too. We create what's called a mulch basin. So this is just a shallow basin near the plant where you want to water. It's full of the wood chips and that's where we're putting the gray water. So the gray water has a space to spread out through this basin. It's filtered by the wood chips. The wood chips soak up the water and then slowly release it over time. So it kind of mitigates the pulses of gray water that happen in the home. Like you do laundry on one day and then there's no water for a couple of days, you do it again. It mitigates that. It helps kind of more slowly release the water. And it also prevents pooling and runoff and other potentially problematic things that gray water could cause if not managed properly. We also use what's called a diverter valve. So this allows you to control your gray water. Do you want it going out to your landscape or do you not? Do you want it going to the sewer like if you're doing your bleach load or maybe there is a flash flood and your water is like full of, or not flash flood, but big rainstorm and all of a sudden there's like standing water in your yard all of a sudden. You definitely don't want to add gray water out there if your soil is totally saturated. You should redirect that. Um, so it allows you to have control. Maybe you want to dye your hair. You don't want to send that out or bleach your hair or whatever. So you might, go, you might want to on occasion put into the water that's not good for your plants. You can turn off your system and then you can turn it back on. These systems, they can be very simple like the picture on the left, um, you have a sink, water flows down the drain, you direct that to a basin by a plant. That's a gray water system, super simple. Picture on the right, they can be really high tech. This is also a gray water system. Um, the gray water is filtered by an external filter that, that, so then you can send it into a drip irrigation system. That external filter gets automatically cleaned on a timed basis by Back, getting back flush with city water. You can manage, um, or excuse me, monitor all the water you're saving on your smartphone. Uh, if you don't have enough gray water, you can pull in another source of water, maybe rainwater, maybe the municipal supply. And this is also a gray water system. So these systems can be really simple with really affordable, a uh, really low, low kind of what can go wrong. That's a, always a good question to ask yourself with any system. Very little can go wrong. System on the right, much more high tech, much more complex, much more expensive, and there's many more moving parts, things that could potentially break. So you need a much higher skill level of installer and takes a lot more to um, make sure the system is running properly. These are both gray water systems. I'm gonna start with simple systems, which are not always as simple as the picture because the simple systems are more affordable. Um, they're, they're often, yeah, they're just often a better choice for more people um, to fit into an existing home. And these simple systems, they irrigate larger plants really well. They're great if you wanna irrigate trees or bushes or vines, any large annual or perennial, like imagine a tomato, like a healthy tomato plant or bigger. That's a great sized plant for a simple gray water system. And it's just a logistical thing. The simple systems, they can't distribute the water to many, many, many places. They're better at putting out a larger amount of water in a few different locations. So you wanna target your plants that need more water, like your bigger plants. They are not suitable for irrigating lawns or lots of small plants. Um, those require a more complex type of system if you want to irrigate that type of plant. Here is an example of a kind of really great gray water irrigated landscape. Um, you can see some trees, there's some bushes, there's a lot of low water use plants going around. So not every single plant is irrigated in the landscape, but there's 
points of irrigation going to the plants that need more water. So this is a very low water use landscape that the plants that do need water are being irrigated by gray water. You can also irrigate, uh, if you're into permaculture, what's called a fruit tree guild, where you have a fruit tree and then you have herbs or other plants growing around it. That's a great thing to irrigate with gray water because you can irrigate in that basin and then all the different plants can access that water. Uh, here's kind of a picture of one where the gray water is going into those little circular green circles. You can see that in the mulch. That's where the water's going. And then there's a tree <clears throat> that's receiving the water as well as those um, different plants around the side. So one of the simplest systems that does not need a permit in California, if you follow basic guidelines, is called a laundry to landscape system. And this is often um, the best system to kind of start with. It's often the only system that a home can install if you have slab on grade construction, and it works really well. It's very flexible. It works in a lot of different um, kind of configurations of how your home is constructed, how your landscape is. It works on flat yards, it works on downward sloping yards. It doesn't work if your yard is going uphill from away from your washing machine because the machine is actually connected right to the washing machine. So if you can see in the picture, there's a washing machine. It's got a pump inside it. It pumps out the water. It's pumping it instead of directly into your sewer connection, it's pumping it into this diverter valve. So you, read, you, you take the washer discharge hose, you connect it to the valve directly. One side of the diverter goes back to the sewer so when your valve is turned one direction, literally nothing has changed about the house. Everything's exactly the same. Um, the other side of the valve, this is going to direct the water out to your landscape. So you have to go outside. So you need to get through a wall or the floor. If you have a crawl space, you can go down through the floor and then out. Or if you have an exterior wall nearby, you can go straight out through the wall. Now you set up an irrigation system that's specialized for the laundry. It's similar to a drip system, but everything's bigger. So the lint and debris can flow through your system, can get out into the mulch and then be filtered once it's outside. And it's sort of like a spot irrigation system. It only goes to a few places, uh, depending on your type of machine. It might be four to 15. It kind of, there are some details that I'm not going to go into today, um, but just know, there, you know there's definitely details if you're ready to build this. But it goes to a, a few places, maybe, yeah, six, seven, kind of depends on your machine couple of trees, your bushes, parts of your landscape. And now you are irrigating those with your washing machine. Um, you can see the cost. It's not too expensive if you're a do-it-yourselfer, a couple hundred dollars. Um, if you put in like a drip system, if you fix something in your house that breaks, if you feel comfortable you know, using tools, working with plastic pipe, this is totally a do-it-yourself project. It's pretty straightforward. The hardest part is getting from inside to out. That's really the, the hardest part of the system. Everything else is very forgiving. You can always change it. It's just plastic tubing, plastic pipe. If you're not a do-it-yourselfer, then it's usually a one job, one day installation, uh, maybe two. This picture is showing a super straightforward installation. Uh, your home might have a concrete um, walkway that goes right up against your house that now you have to cut with the concrete saw and then pass the pipe through that and then patch the concrete. Or you might be going like under a deck and you might be working in the crawl space. So there's a lot of factors that can add a lot of time, which would mean more labor um, costs to the system or not, or your home might be just like this picture. And I don't know. Here's some pictures of it. So there's on the picture on the left, you can see the washing machine is connected right to that valve. Uh, the sewer side is behind the machine, so one side goes back to the sewer. The other side, in this picture, there's a crawl space, so it's going straight through the floor, and then it gets out to the yard through the crawl space. The picture on the right, um, you can see the washer hose going to the valve. It's a different brand, so now it has a yellow handle versus the red, but it's the same kind of valve. The On the right side of that valve is going to the sewer. The left side is going to the gray water, and this is an exterior wall, so the pipe goes straight through the wall and out to the landscape. So here's what it looks like in the landscape. You can see it's similar to drip. Everything's just bigger. The basin, this is a, these trees are very young. Um, you can see they're small, small fruit trees. The basin is going in front of them. There's kind of a row of them. And those black circular things, that's where the gray water flows out. The bottom of that's empty. There's no, no bottom to that circle. It's kind of like a cone. And the, there's a lid that goes on top. So the gray water flows through the air into the wood chips and then down. Um, and then when the lid is on, that's where you can access and check on your system. Um, that prevents 
roots from clogging up the system. So you don't want the roots to be able to actually get right to where your gray water is coming out because they'll grow through up your pipe and clog it up. It's another picture of a row of uh, along um, the property line that's being irrigated. The gray water tubing's already been buried, so you can just see the little um, gray water outlets kind of poking out, going into those valve boxes. So that's where the gray water is going to come out, and then that whole trench will be filled with wood chips. And here's two more pictures. Picture on the left, it's irrigating that row of fruit trees. Picture on the right, it's irrigating all those different perennials, and there's like one tree in that landscape. So once it's done, there's really not a lot to see. It's very um, subtle. Just, you're doing laundry, it's flowing out, irrigating your landscape. Uh, very little maintenance. Once a year, you need to go out and check on the system. You might need to replace some of that mulch as it decomposes. But other than that, there's the system just works really well on its own. And one more picture. You can see if you're kind of turning your eye to where gray water outlets are now, you can see those green circles. That's where the gray water is coming out. Um, just to note that you will see these used all over that not for gray water. With gray water, we're kind of adapting other irrigation components. So these are used for, your, it's called an irrigation valve box, which are used to put irrigation valves in. So a lot of landscapes have them that are not, don't have gray water systems. So just if you see this, no, it's not always a gray water system, but we do use them in gray water systems. Um, if anybody has a washing machine in their basement, like I mentioned, the laundry machine is not made, it's not like super powerful, so it's not made to pump up high or, you know, go, go too far, though it works great on flat yards or downward sloping yards. It's not made to pump out of a basement and then into your landscape. So if you have a basement washer, um, then there, there is an option for you. I just want to mention that. It's a, but it's kind of a different um, system. It's an external pump, and then it would pump it through this type of gray water system. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some shower options. Um, there, if you can tap into your shower, again, you have to have a crawl space or a basement, some way to get to the pipes or external plumbing. Sometimes the pipes run on the outside of the home. You need to be able to get to them from below, below the shower um, or bath. In this picture, you can see the shower flows through that pipe. There's a diverter valve underneath the building. So it's the same concept. It's a bigger valve because now we're working with bigger pipes. Um, and it diverts the water to the landscape, goes outside, it's flowing by gravity. So this works, this particular system works really well if your landscape is lower than your plumbing and the plants you want to irrigate are either close to the home, like within 10, 15 feet, or your home is sloping downward at any, any amount of slope, just slightly downward. Um, because this is flowing by gravity now, so you're slipping the pipe, dividing up the water, going to your different trees basically, or bushes. This system works really well for bigger plants. The material cost is a little bit more than the laundry system. Installation cost is typically kind of a lot more, um, though it depends, because the system takes a lot more labor to install. Um, sometimes it's really simple to put in that diverter valve. It's, if you have plastic ABS plumbing, there's a nice you know, area to put the valve in. It's really easy. Sometimes it's not, you actually have to do a lot of reconfiguring of the plumbing and that can add a lot of cost to the system if you have extra plumbing work. Um, it could be a do-it-yourself project. It could need a professional um, depending on your skill level and especially the plumbing of your home. Old plumbing can be, you definitely want a plumber to be, be there fixing your plumbing. If it's old metal pipes, it can be really challenging. New plastic pipes, pretty easy. Uh, so yeah, that's the branch drain system. Here's some pictures of it, uh, pictures of that valve under the home. You can imagine that you, you, know, you always want a way to redirect the water easily back to the, the sewer. And if it's in your crawl space, that's not really very accessible. Luckily, it's quite easy to add a motor to the valve. It's called an actuator. It just sticks right on the valve itself and it has a plug-in. Um, it needs to just plug into an outlet and then you have a little switch in the home. So you can control it in the home. Uh, you can put the switch somewhere convenient, maybe in the bathroom, maybe in the utility room, just kind of whatever works for your home. And then you can turn that system on and off from inside the house. Here's a picture of the landscape. Um, this is a very small yard. This is actually in San Francisco. So that's the entire yard and it's a one bedroom um, house. So it's a really pretty, everything's pretty small here, but it's a good example of how one shower can go out and irrigate one landscape. So you can see 
the pipes are coming out, they're branching, there's these basins, uh, the basins are filled with wood chips. And this soil type, everything drains pretty quickly here. This is a sandy type of soil. If you were working in clay soil situations, your basins will be a lot bigger because the water drains more slowly. But this is a kind of, everything's small in this particular site. So you can see that basin, that's where the water flows in, the plants are planted adjacent to the basin. And then here is the completed system on the left and then the one year later picture on the right. Um, so I wanna talk about a couple of other kinds of systems. The, sometimes you cannot use gravity. You might have an upward sloping yard or maybe you have a patio you have to cross or a deck or something where you can't flow by gravity out to your plants. And then you can pump the gray water. The simplest way to do that is you have what's called a simple pump system. Um, the water flows into your tank. It's a surge tank. It's not storing water. It's just temporarily connecting it. And the pump inside is going to turn on as soon as that tank fills up. It's usually about 30 gallons, maybe 50 gallons. So again, you're not storing it. You're just collecting it up. So when it fills, the, tank, the pump turns on and then it pumps out all the water into the irrigation system. The irrigation is the same as that laundry system. So it's bigger than a drip. Outlets are bigger. The lint and hair and stuff can flow through the system, not clog it. And then it gets filtered in the landscape. Um, this has to have an overflow back to the sewer. There's, of course, a lot of little details, but this is kind of the concept. You need to have a place to, you have to be able to tap into the pipes and then have a location for the tank. Here's two examples. The picture on the left is a basement where the tank is. The picture on the right is a crawl space. Um, sometimes the tank can just be buried right outside the house. You can send the water outside and then bury the tank right next to the house. So it'll be all the way you know, out of, out of, you can like walk over it, but you do need access to it um, next to the, the home. Put a little um, cover on it. Um, and then there are also systems that can, that try to filter the water before it leaves the system. And that way you can send it into a drip irrigation system. Um, the more lower cost methods of this, they have a filter that is a manually cleaning filter, it requires somebody to clean it out for the whole system to work. And then it goes into a drip, a specialized drip system. The picture on the right there is showing you drip. That's not actually a gray water system, but just to see how the gray water is coming out, little bits of water are being spread out over a, lot of a tubing. So you can cover a large area. You can irrigate a lot of small plants. Um, gray water, even filtered gray water is dirtier than um, to, like municipal supply water. So you can't send gray water into your existing drip system. You have to have a drip system that's made for dirty water. So it's the technology is a little different. Uh, a regular drip would clog up from filtered gray water. So just know that. Um, the filter, this kind of system is very prone to failure because one, people don't clean their filter, they forget. Uh, and then when they forget the whole system fails. So just want you to know that. So if you're feeling like, oh, I really want a drip system, this sounds great. Um, kind of take a pause and say, it, it, it does sound great, but actually in practice, it's often not great. It often fails. What could work is if you get a maintenance contract with your installer and they clean your filter on a regular basis, that can work. But if you think you're gonna clean it forever on a regular basis, I would say probably not gonna work. Um, going kind of one step up, there are systems that have this filtration and then the filter is automatically cleaned by a back flushing mechanism. And the cost really, you know, we were talking about a couple hundred dollars, do it yourself project, a couple thousand dollars, you know, a couple day job. Now we're talking about 10,000, 15,000, maybe $20,000. Like the scale of the cost um, goes just way up when you get to these automatic um, systems. And the, yeah, because it's not a do it yourself project and all this stuff is more expensive. So now we're in a different kind of cost bracket and complexity. Um, situation. But these systems can function just like a regular irrigation system, though again, the drip components are not the same. They're for dirty water, but everything else can function. You can have irrigation controllers, you can have timers, you can have lots of zones, you can irrigate practically any type of landscape with it. And here's a couple of companies that do that kind of system. Um, and as we're getting to the end, I want to talk about a couple other things. If you are building a new home, or if you want to be an advocate for future gray water um, options in your community, there are ways where you can, if you, if you plan gray water during the time the building's being built, it really doesn't add any cost at all. Maybe just a 
very, very, very small amount. Because when the plumber is doing all the plumbing of the home, if they just keep the gray water separate, put in that valve, um, cap it off, keep on going, it's really no extra cost. To go back and retrofit a home, that can be extremely expensive, uh, especially if you have like slab on grade, that's a huge job. But to put it in while the home's being built, not, not expensive at all. So it's really great if people can plan it. If you're planning a new home construction, you can save yourself a lot of fuss later on by planning for this. If your community is really interested in saving water, there's ordinances that are to support this where you require homes to be built to be ready for gray water. They're called like drought ready construction or gray water ready, and they just require this planning to, be go, to go in place. Um, so I just wanna point that out. This, the link you see on here is a place where you can go and get a model ordinance that has um, diagrams and language suggestions that communities can then take and adapt. Or if you're building a home, you can take those pictures and show them to your builder and say, please do this. Um, so if you're thinking about gray water design, your first question is what source can you access? Then you figure out how much does your home produce? Then you calculate knowing how much you produce, how many plants can you irrigate? And then you pick a system that's gonna meet your needs. If you are looking at your trees and your bigger plants, you do not need drip. You can go with one of the, the unfiltered where you're filtering in the landscape systems. If your landscape um, is lots of small plants spread out over a wide area, you will need a drip system. Or you can just irrigate a portion of your landscape with the gray water, but you won't be able to spread it all out. So you want to think about all those things, your options, what's going to make the most sense for your home and your, your yard and your budget. Um, and so just to, we're getting to the end, I just want to take one um, step back for thinking about design. So now we've talked about rainwater, different ways to use rainwater. We've talked about gray water, different systems. So when you think about your home and your landscape, think about how all these pieces might be able to work together. If you're coming into this kind of new, like maybe you haven't done any of these systems, but you're interested in, it's a lot. There's a lot of things to that you have, a lot of options, and doing them all at once is really unfeasible. Usually, it is for me anyway. I like to know all the kind of know where I'm going and then pick one as a good place to start. So, this is kind of the know where you're going, how to do a little mapping of your landscape. You can look at your landscape and really simply plan out where do you have access to gray water? Where would be a great place to put your rainwater tank? Where is a good place for a rain garden? And when you think about your gray water sources, um, if you're designing a new landscape, then you can say, okay, now this is a great place to plant my fruit trees because it's right by where the shower pipes are coming out. If your home's already built, you can't do that necessarily, but you can think about how you can maybe change your landscape over time to fit into your gray water or how you can irrigate the suitable portions of your landscape and maybe transition other parts of your landscape to be a low water use landscape if it's not already. So here's kind of the how this could look. This home in the front, there's one section where there's no rainwater potential and uh, no gray water. So that's where you can plant really low water use native plants. And then there's another place where a green garden would go really well. That'll also grow native plants and only be sustained by the rain once the plants are established. And then we get to the back where the gray water sources are. That shower can irrigate some fruit trees near the house on the side. The washing machine can move the water around to the back of the house, irrigate some perennials, a privacy screen, berry patch, kind of bypass the play area, bypass the sitting area. And then the far right back, that's a great place for the rain tank. It's out of the way and it can irrigate maybe a vegetable garden or help irrigate. It might probably won't irrigate it all year long. So just give you some resources and then we'll end with the questions. Um, Gray Water Action's website, we have a lot of resources. We have online classes that are more in depth. Um, we have you know, past webinars about really specific topics you can uh, watch. We have Spanish um, language resources as well as Chinese Mandarin, some recorded presentations. Uh, we have a forum. So if you have technical questions, you can put them in the forum. So there's a, it's a great place to go for resources. I also wrote two books that are how-to books. So they're great for if you are do-it-yourselfer or if you wanna work with someone else and you wanna understand kind of where you're going. Um, they're also great if you can't find someone trained in gray water, but you have someone who wants to learn, they really can take you step by step through how to do it. Like maybe you have a landscaper that you like, um, that could install a system for you, like a landscape contractor, but they haven't yet. So with a resource like gray water, green landscape, they could easily and successfully implement these systems, um, by following the instructions. So it takes you through step by step, the design, as well as the installation and how to make them work in your home. So I'm going to end there for questions or comments. 
Okay, great. So we do have a couple of questions. So let me scroll to the top here. So Susan is asking if there's areas in the country or even throughout the world where these systems are being installed um, at the point of development. Um, there are, so in the world, yes, there's a lot of, but I'll just stick with the US. Um, there are some examples of some developments trying out like a kind of pilot project with some of the manufactured systems. Um, there are communities requiring the plumbing to happen, like the gray water ready plumbing, um, but not requiring the system. It's a little, to require gray water is a little challenging because it's sort of like one tool in the toolbox and it may not be the best tool for this particular site, but to require buildings to be ready for it, that's definitely um, beneficial. Um, I think if you're looking at what interest in this in the, in the kind of the larger scale, like how would this work? I want to share one example of a, a lodge. It's called Evergreen Lodge and in Yosemite. And Evergreen has a, a sister lodge called Rush Creek. So Evergreen has 55 cabins that every single one is irrigating the landscape around it with the, the shower water. So there's kind of 55 separate systems. And then they have the commercial their commercial facilities, like their laundry that's doing the whole lodge's laundry, that's on a more um, um, like a pumped and filtered system, whereas the little cabins are these simple gravity systems. And then they have their staff dorms on a system. So altogether, I think they're recycling about 2 million gallons a year, but each system is you know small. It's just all working together. And then their sister lodge, Rush Creek, is even bigger. So that's a great example if you're kind of trying to see how this can all work together and how big of savings you can get overall. Um, I couldn't tell you like a town that's doing that. And some of the developments that have done it, I think they've had some challenges because they picked uh, manufactured systems, which often have some technical problems. Um, so I know some of them had to rip out the systems or turn disconnect the systems. And um, so the most successful example I can give you with is these lodges that, that applied with the simple, with the, the cabins, they use the simple systems with their commercial, they use the more advanced systems and they've been operating for many years working really well. Okay, and then Susan is also asking about the cylinders in the system. I'm assuming she's talking about the, the modified valve boxes. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, an irrigation valve box, if I had one, it'd be so much easier. It's just, it's like a cone, like it's like, yeah, it kind of cones out. The bottom is totally empty and there's a lid that goes on that you can remove. Uh, that creates this air space where, so you drill a little hole into the side of that. You put in the tube that where the gray water is coming out. So the gray water is flowing into this open area where no roots can grow. Roots are not gonna grow in the air. And then it lands, the wood chips are below it and around it. So it's going through the wood chips, soaking around and then into the soil. Um, this is really important because it prevents the roots from growing up inside your gray water system. If you just put your gray water like right into the mulch, just cover it up, the roots will, they can sense water, they'll grow to the water. They'll say, oh, it's coming out of that pipe. I'm gonna grow in that pipe because I want that water. They'll grow up your pipe, up your system. They'll clog everything up. Um, so this prevents that from happening. Okay, and Cheryl says that she's currently use, reusing her bath water to water her trees. Um, but she puts Epsom salts in the bath water. Is that okay for the trees? Um, I would say probably. I, if you're doing it all the time, um, you might want to actually test the water. You can send your, your water to a, a lab and test it for irrigation suitability. Um, I guess I don't know enough to, about, I'm never, I'm not sure about Epsom salts, though I think on occasion they would be fine. But if it's every time, I would probably want to know for sure. And I can't answer that. So, sorry. Okay, and then Catherine says um, she's asking if you were going to talk about dry toilets. Um, I wasn't, but if there's time, I'm happy to. Um, if there aren't any other gray water questions. Um, let's see, Bob just asked. Oh, no, he's talking about, um, about the valve boxes alternatives to that. So that was the last question. Um, yeah, so alternate alternatives to the valve boxes, you can also use p sections of a wider grade pipe, like a drainage pipe that's like maybe six inches wide, and just cut it in little sections and then put like a paving stone over the top of it. So you can adapt them, but you want something pretty strong 
um, that you can get into. So I find that the valve boxes work great. They are more expensive. So if you just get a big, you know, one section of like 10 feet of pipe, wide diameter pipe, you cut it up, you can make your own for much less money that are just as strong. You just need to make your own lid, your own cover, like a, a little paver or something. Great. And that was the, the last question that we received. Okay. Um, so y'all mentioned waterless toilets. So like, again, at the home scale, you, the toilet water is not safe to reuse or allowed um, and can't you know, just go out into these simple systems because it contains fecal matter, which can transmit diseases. Um, so waterless toilet is an alternative. It's, gonna, it's basically going to compost the material in a safe way that doesn't use water. So that prevents the potential um, water contamination if the water is getting out into the environment. Um, California doesn't, so about regulations, California is pretty silent on composting toilets, um, but they're not disallowed. So if you have a home and you have a flush toilet that works and you have an, everything's, you know, up to code with your home or not everything, if you have like a, if you have either a septic system or you're on the sewer, and then you, in addition, put in like a composting toilet in your somewhere, that's not breaking any laws. Um, there are ones you can purchase, there are ones you can make. Um, there's, of course, you need to manage it safely, make sure you don't have contact, you don't have vectors, but they are. there's lots of great resources about that. Like my book, The Waterwise Home has a whole chapter on how to do that. Um, so it's definitely a great water saver. Me and many other people would like it to actually be explicitly legal and allowed in California. So that's a conversation that's coming up more often, especially in fire rebuilds and with water stresses. There's some situations where a composting toilet makes a lot more sense because the site maybe can't handle a septic, um, but the site could handle just managing the gray water. And then if the home had a composting toilet, then that could be a really safe option. So it's come up in like fire rebuild communities where people are having a hard time going home because of they can't put in these new, it, the cost to put in these advanced septic systems is too high. And they used to have a composting toilet um, kind of under the radar. Um, so yeah, there, there's definitely some statewide conversations happening of what would need to change to make this just allowed, not just kind of quietly done, not breaking any laws on the side. Um, but in the technology, it's totally there. It's, you know, it's just nature happening. There's just ways you want to have it work so it um, is easy for the user and safe for the environment. Um, there's lots of states that allow them. They're permitted. There's certifications that some companies have, and then there's ways to build your own um, that work as well. Great. And if folks want to get a hold of your books, how can they, how can they get them? Um, they're like, there's, um, usually you can get them from libraries. You can buy them anywhere. You can buy online books. Um, there's e-versions. They're pretty available. I can send a link off our website. We have a link to the publisher. They have a couple of purchasing options. Great. And we'll include that, that link in our follow-up and any other resources that you have. Great, and I, I just want to um, plug a couple of our programs um, that relate to this. So if you are interested in setting up a rain garden or a low water use garden, um, we do have a $2 per square foot rebate. Um, and if you are looking for ideas, we actually did a gardening series a few months ago um, with Surfrider Foundation. So we have a, a great video on ocean friendly gardens. So definitely be sure to check that out. And if you're interested in, um, uh, more ways to reuse water. We do have a mobile reuse pickup program where residents can um, bring a container to our wastewater facility and pick up uh, tertiary treated water and take that back to, um, to water their landscape. So you can check that program out on our website, uh, both those programs. And I'll, in the follow-up email, I will include um, a link to our rebates and incentives program. That way you can check out all the great, great programs that might fit your needs. So with that, let's see. So we have a couple of questions trickling in now. Um, Jeanette says, thank you. Very well prepared and presented. So kudos. Let's see. And then Anne is, our rain barrel vouchers only for residents of the city of Ventura. So yes, our rain barrel voucher program is only for city residents. Um, but if you live in another city, chances are they probably have their own program as well. So check out your, your city's website. Um, and I will bet that they have a rain barrel program or some cities even have a, uh, a rebate on gray water systems as well. So with that, I think that is the last of questions. So thank you so much, Laura. It was a great presentation. Um, I'm sure folks really learned a lot. And thank you everyone so much for, for joining us on your Saturday.
Um, if you like this class and you're interested in attending another class, we do have a class uh, mulch giving coming up in, um, in November where residents can come and pick up mulch. So um, be sure to register for that and uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Of course. All right. Bye-bye.